it's a real pleasure to be here today evening thank you so much for your a warm introduction uh, and of course for affording me this platform um i'm hoping that um, all of you will uh, enjoy uh, the next hour or so as i take you uh, through this fascinating uh, period that i've just written about so let me just give you a brief sense of what exactly i'm going to be talking about today um i'm sure that most of us would have heard of the maurya empire the gupta empire and the delhi sultanate um but these are all polities that are primarily based on the gangetic plains uh and that are separated as you can see in this timeline by considerable stretches of time um there is a lot of fascinating things that happen in the indian subcontinent in each of these gaps of roughly 500 years or so that we're generally not very well aware of um and today i'm going to be talking about one of these particular gaps it's called uh, the early medieval period and it's a really fascinating time to me um because it's a time when you really begin to see the various regions of the indian subcontinent interacting at unprecedented um ranges and depths uh, and also it is of course a time when the deccan really dominates the indian subcontinent um so over the next uh, hour or so what i'm going to be doing uh, is i'm going to be talking you through um the history of the deccan um talking about the dynasties that dominated and how um they justified their power uh, through war violence uh, and of course also through art architecture and literature um so welcome to the world of early medieval india from 600 to 1200 um what happens in this enormous landmass and when i say enormous um it really is enormous just to give you a sense of how big the indian subcontinent is uh portugal's coastline is about this long and france is about this large so we're really talking about uh, a a geopolitical region that in its entirety um is more or less the size of europe um and yet Uh, i would like to ask why is it that when we think about the history of the subcontinent it's really uh, usually only about polities that are based in this one singular region um, ignoring the historical trajectories of these um, much much you know wider world within which they actually existed um so over the course of 600 to 1200 uh, we begin to see some really interesting dynamics emerging as i said briefly in my last uh, slide um we 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 see each of these geopolitical regions um including of course gujarat malwa um the the central the portion this uh, the chota nagpur plateau um the various parts of coastal india and of course bengal already developing these very very fascinating uh, and rich polities um that are pretty unprecedented in terms of the scale and the depth at which they kind of um, integrate local economies into into the way they function um they are also kind of unleashing pretty unprecedented levels of um art and cultural production uh, while simultaneously trading with the world at large um just to give you a few glimpses of objects that are produced in this period um, i'd like you i'd like to direct your attention to this magnificent painted manuscript um from bengal in the pala period um you can really almost imagine the the brush strokes and the keen eye uh that the artist of of, of this particular manuscript have had uh, look at that the beautiful calligraphy um on and on those buddhist verses that he's kind of inscribed and of course that that magnificent painting um of a buddhist deity this probably avalokiteshvara and you can see that the way it's depicted uh, the way he's depicted is very similar to the way you really think of a um of a deity that's usually thought of as exclusively hindu uh, he's sitting on a throne he's got these flowers he's got an attendant uh, offering him worship um which ties into um, a larger religious dynamic in this period uh, namely the emergence of tantrism uh, which is really one of the characteristics of uh, early medieval religion um this object here uh, which hopefully i will be i will have some time to discuss in a little more detail down the line uh, is a coin of the rashtrakuta emperor govinda the 3 uh, the rashtrakutas were dynasty that ruled over the deccan um but very interestingly this gold coin actually has uh, these in, these interesting geometric shapes uh, along the coin uh, which are actually inspired by the arabic script uh, because the rashtrakutas uh, traded extensively with the arabs and it's possible that um, this is meant to indicate uh, a kind of a global outlook on behalf of the rashtrakuta king um finally of course uh, this uh, magnificent shrine here is actually I was actually built in Odisha uh, in the 12th century um, and you can just looking at it uh, it's not a very large picture we will have larger pictures of temples later in the presentation uh, but hopefully it should give you a sense of the sheer kind of uh, architectural and engineering abilities of the parties of this time um so even though it plays very little role in our understanding of how india came to be india uh, the early medieval period is really one of the most uh, fertile culturally uh, fertile periods culturally politically and economically speaking um so let's uh let's come to the deccan now let's talk about what really makes the deccan special to this time um over the course of these 500 years uh, i i actually talk about this in great detail in my book um you have three major dynasties that arise and fall in the deccan 
Uh, the first are the Chalukyas of Vatapi, and I'm going to spend a little time talking about them, um, and especially talking about their art and how you can use the art to kind of understand uh, the way these individuals kind of saw themselves and their place in the world. Um, I'd like to direct your attention first to this image on the left of your screen. Um, this is uh, of a, a sculpture of Varaha from Udayagiri, which is um, a, a site in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, it was commissioned by the Gupta Emperor Chandragupta II, um, to commemorate his victory over a number of kings from various uh, Naga dynasties in central India, uh, with names like Ganapati Naga, Nandi Naga, that kind of thing. And you can really see what a marvelous piece this is, compositionally speaking. Um, the, the god is depicted as a very kind of um, vigorous and almost, um, almost voluptuous man um, who is planting his foot quite powerfully uh, on, on this quailing Naga here on, on, on the bottom right. Um, and he's using the force of this to kind of propel his entire body upwards um, while uh, bearing on his shoulder uh, a diminutive representation of the goddess of Prithvi uh, or uh, Bhudevi, uh, the goddess of the earth. Um, and an inscription that was left near this uh, sculpture makes it pretty clear that it's actually meant to be an analogy for the Gupta Emperor Chandragupta II. Um, uh, just as Chandragupta had defeated uh, various Naga kings, uh, the implication is that Varaha too has defeated the Nagas and rescued the earth. And therefore, you can really interpret Chandragupta as a kind of earthly manifestation of the god uh, who has saved the earth through enacting violence on rival kings. Um, now, if you look at the sculpture on your on your right, um, this is from uh, Badami in northern Karnataka, uh, which was the capital of the Chalukya dynasty, uh, who are one of the most important dynasties of the early medieval Deccan. Um, and you can immediately see that it's, it's very similar to this one, compositionally speaking. Um, it has the same feature of uh, a god planting his foot um, on a naga and using the force of that to kind of uh, generate an upward thrust to raise the goddess earth out of it, uh, except she's, she's actually a little bit larger. She's uh, almost caressing him um, in, in, a, uh, in an intimate fashion, um, and he is grasping her uh, firmly with his hand. Um, the, the, the style of the sculpture is also far more elegant. Uh, he's much more bejeweled than the example that we saw in Madhya Pradesh. Um, now, this one, this 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 image here on the right was actually commissioned um, barely a century or so after uh, the one on your left. Um, so it's very obvious that the Chalukyas probably heard of this idea that the Guptas had of associating themselves uh, with the divine kingship and trying to uh, connect themselves directly to the gods through sculpture. Um, and he chose to depict uh, Varaha in this sense in order to make that connection. Uh, and the reason why we're able to may say that with some degree of certainty um, is because of two things. First, if you look at the title, the imperial title that the Chalukyas used, um, it's it, they of course they call themselves Maharaja and Maharaja Di Raja, although the usual fancy uh, Indian imperial titles, uh, but they also call themselves Sri Prithvi Vallabha, uh, which means uh, fortunes favored in Earth's beloved, uh, a title of Vishnu, uh, because Vishnu, uh, like the Chalukya kings, uh, was married in a sense uh, to the goddess of fortune and to the goddess of earth. So what the Chalukyas are doing through claiming this title and commissioning this sculpture is once again claiming to be a manifestation of Vishnu on earth. Um, and if you also look at uh, this verse that I have in the center of the screen is actually uh, the preamble that you see to most Chalukya land grants, uh, which has this marvelous kind of image, uh, victorious as Vishnu made manifest as the boar, shaking the ocean as he comes into view with the earth resting at peace on the tip of his upraised right tusk. Um, this, this gives you this, this magnificent image of an ocean that is still and is suddenly shaken by the emergence of this gigantic deity um, bearing the earth on its tusk. Uh, and just as the Varaha has rescued uh, the earth and the, the earth is now at peace because of the God's efforts, so too it is uh, at peace because of the efforts of the Chalukya kings. Um, so it's it's very interesting to me how the Chalukyas kind of use uh, both art and religion to legitimize themselves uh, as a newly emerging imperial power in the Deccan uh, in the late 6th century. Um, by the early 8th century, the Chalukyas really become a very established power in the medieval Deccan. In fact, they are one of the dominant powers of, of India in general. Um, we know of a king uh, called Vijayaditya, who is uh, believed to have raided as far north um, as, as Madhya Pradesh. And we also know that they fought multiple successful wars in the Tamil region. Um, and all of the loot that they generated 
uh, through this wealth was usually used to build these enduring stone monuments, uh, namely temples. Um, the, most of the most of the temples, most of the earliest temples in southern India were actually commissioned by the Chalukya dynasty. Uh, but I'd like to encourage you over the course of the next few slides uh, to kind of think of these temples as um, more than simply ex uh, expressions of piety. Um, as we will see, hopefully, these temples are actually um, very unique examples of religious buildings that also have a fairly obvious political messages encoded into their walls. Uh, but in order to understand that first, uh, I'd just like to take a little bit of an aside and help you understand uh, the architectural logic of the early medieval period. Um, when you look uh, at these temples, you know, uh, when you search for them online, um, you'll mostly get a, you know, a few lines of uh, a rather boring description if I'm saying, oh, it's so intricately carved, and so it's so beautifully carved and so on. But um, what really was the logic? Why were they designed to take this particular shape, this particular form? Um, I'd like to direct your attention to these images here on your left. Um, and in particular to this and this image, these two diagrams here. Um, if you look at this, which basically has a little kind of dome shaped roof um, and kind of look at this uh, overall temple structure here, you see this kind of dome shaped roof is actually exactly replicated here in the corner of this temple. Uh, and right next to it is this kind of barrel shaped structure. Uh, I hope you can see my mouse and you can see that that's exactly this structure here, right? Um, so basically, and then once you look at the next tier, the tier above this, you see again, the same kind of pattern where you have once again, this kind of dome shaped structure, and then you have a barrel shape. And then once again, you have a dome shape and on top of it, once again, is the dome shape. Um, so what is the logic of this? Uh, basically what is happening is that through the repetition, the rhythmic repetition of very similar looking architectural modules, uh, you are giving the building a very real sense of movement and dynamism. Um, if you look at this image of this temple here, you see that on top is a large dome. And then once you look at the diagonal axis of symmetry, uh, a smaller dome, a smaller dome, a somewhat larger dome, and then a much larger dome. If you look at its uh, horizontal axis of symmetry, uh, you see the dome, and then a barrel shaped structure, and then a larger barrel shape, and then a much larger barrel shape. So in a very real sense, it seems like the, the weight of the superstructure of the temple is kind of cascading down tier by tier. Uh, and emanating and, and coming outwards, uh, almost like the emergence of, of a god uh, from nothingness uh, into form. Um, and the, the early medieval Deccan is really fascinating uh, in terms of how it uses this architectural logic. Uh, because if you look at these two diagrams here, um, you will see that once again, the same kind of barrel shaped shrine that, that I pointed out here um, is kind of repeated. What they've done is they've taken another barrel shaped shrine, they've rotated it at 90 degrees and embedded it right into the center of this. So you can see there's a barrel shape and then there's the side of the barrel shape. And once again, the same kind of side of the shrine is showing up here. Um, and here you can see that what it is they're taking a barrel shape they put another barrel shape shrine and then they put a 90 degree rotated barrel shape shrine so um if you look at the walls of this temple they're not still they're not flat uh they are full of dynamism they're full of this a uh, layered sense of emanation and there's a rhythm and recesses and an interplay of light and dark in the walls of these temples um and these were taken fairly sophisticated um, design senses that evolved over many, many centuries to kind of execute. So a temple is never really just a, a stale expression of piety. Uh, it's really an expression of engineering uh, and design skills by what would have been the most skilled professionals of the time. Um, now, why was it that I went on this whole discourse about temples? Why do temples really matter? Um, the simple answer to that is that, as I said a little earlier, temples encode political messages. And once you know how to read them, you really begin to see temples as much, much more uh, than what we usually think. Um, this image that you see on the left uh, is actually from the temple that I was showing you a little earlier. Um, you can see that it's got um, Ravana, uh, the demon king, uh, with, with his ten heads, a very kind of a vigorous looking chap who is um, kind of pushing up this larger hill upon which a number of smaller terrified figures uh, are, are being shaken uh, by his overwhelming strength. Uh, and on top, of course, are Shiva and Parvati, uh, who don't seem too discomfited by what Ravana is doing. Um, why was it that Ravana, a demon, is given such a prominent place in a temple? Um, the reason for that, according to art historians, uh, is probably because Ravana is meant to be an analogy for the king um, whose wife commissioned this temple. Um, his name was Vikramaditya II, um, and he defeated uh, on multiple occasions the Pallava dynasty over the rivals of the Chalukyas. Um, just to give you a sense of that, here's a little map. Um, so 
This roughly was where the Chalukya Empire extended over the course of the 8th century, and this roughly is where the Pallavas were based. Uh, so basically, the Chalukyas went down south, attacked the Pallavas on multiple occasions, and used the wealth they gained from sacking the Pallavas to build this temple. Um, and very clearly, what the sculpture seems to be indicating is just as Ravana shook uh, Kailasha, the mountain of Shiva, to its foundations, so too did Vikramaditya shake uh, the foundation of, of Pallava kingship um, to, to its core. Um, to give you a couple more interesting examples of like how these kind of processes of uh, appropriation and political one-upmanship through religion work, um, I'd like to point out um, this figure from the Great Penance Relief at uh, Mamalapuram, which you can still see today. Um, and you can see here that uh, Shiva is standing, he's got his hand outstretched, uh, he's got a little dwarf next to him, and he's uh, clearly giving a boon of some sort to this uh, em em emaciated uh, ascetic who's standing here. Um, this is meant to be a, a representation of Bhagiratha, the royal sage, um, who prayed to Shiva to kind of capture the river Ganga in his hair as she came from the heavens to the earth. Um, and we can infer that from the fact that this cleft that you can see in the center of the sculpture uh, originally used to have water flowing through it. Uh, so it was very much meant as a kind of analogy to just as how Shiva uh, graced Bhagiratha with his favor. Uh, similarly, Shiva was believed to have uh, graced the Pallava king with his favor. And that Pallava king was believed to be uh, the special beloved of Shiva as a result. Uh, and that is a claim that this culture is trying to make. Now, uh, I couldn't get a larger picture, but uh, I think if you look a little closely at this image here in this red circle, um, you'll see that there's a very similar looking standing figure with his hand outstretched and a small dwarf-like thing right next to him. This is exactly the same image that has been copied by the Chalukyas and placed in their own temple. Um, why was this? Because the Chalukyas defeated the Pallavas militarily. What they're trying to say is, just as the Pallavas once claimed to be favored by Shiva, we are clearly the ones who are favored by Shiva now, and therefore we are going to take the same image that the Pallavas used to make this claim and incorporate it onto the walls of our own temple, um, and which immediately adds so much more context and so much more complexity uh, to how we can think about these shrines. Um, um, I was asked at the beginning, uh, sorry, when we were setting up this, this talk to actually uh, focus a little bit on personalities. So let me let me talk to you a little bit about uh, Vikramatya II's uh, wife and his chief queen, Loka Mahadevi. Um, this is a sculpture that is believed to be Loka Mahadevi on the temple that we've been talking about, uh, which is called the Lokeshwara Temple. Um, and we can guess that this is Loka Mahadevi for two reasons. The first is uh, that she has a little scepter that she's holding, which is surmounted by an elephant, uh, which is generally the sign of Indian kingship. So very possibly uh, that's scepter was actually what the Chalukya kings used uh, in court to give their orders. Uh, and she's also standing on this little stool kind of thing uh, with three lions under it. Um, this would have been a lion throne, um, which is again uh, associated with Indian kingship. So very clearly this that we're looking at here is a royal lady. Um, now the woman that you see on the right is probably also a royal lady, right? Because similarly she too is standing on a little stool that's got two lions under it instead of three. So maybe she's of inferior status to Loka Mahadevi. Um, so who exactly is this? Uh, according to scholars, it's probably Trilokya Mahadevi, Loka Mahadevi's younger sister. Uh, but for most of Trilokya Mahadevi's life, she was actually the senior queen. Uh, to Loka Mahadevi because she was a mother of the heir of Vikramaditya, who you can actually see represented here as a kind of a cherubish uh, young boy uh, at, at his mother's feet. Um, why is it that Trilokya Mahadevi is depicted in a sister's temple? Is it just because of sisterly love? Um, maybe not. Um, when, tri when Trilokya Mahadevi was the chief queen, uh, she actually commissioned a temple uh, which was not completed because she died, she died uh, when her son was around 13 years old or so. And Loka Mahadevi uh, became the chief queen after that, uh, built her own temple, and then had the sculpture of Trilokya Mahadevi set up in her own temple, looking at the courtyard of Trilokya Mahadevi's then unfinished temple, um, which is very interesting. Why was it so important for the elder sister, once she became the predominant queen, to depict her younger sister and basically, in a sense, imprison her um, to, to look at the temple that she could never finish while standing in her elder sister's completed temple? Um, was there a sibling rivalry here uh, that has not been written about in the sources? Uh, it's very interesting. We'll have the answer, perhaps, because we won't have their diaries. Uh, but it is very interesting to speculate that uh, there is much more personality and ambition um, and much more darkness to these individuals um, than we generally think. Um, so moving, moving on. Um, um, the reason I've been talking so much about temples is because I feel like, just generally speaking, uh, 
temples are, are 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 we don't do justice to temples because it reduces them to being nothing more than expressions of royal piety um whereas in reality they are fascinating historical objects as i've been showing you uh there are if you look at them from an art historical perspective you can learn so much about the politics of the people who made them uh but you can also of course learn a lot about the design sense of the people who made them um if you look at this temple on your left um you'll see that you know uh, if you, what we were talking about earlier was how the, how temples are decorated with little uh, miniature architectural modules. Um, the architectural modules aren't really that obvious on this temple. I mean, they're there. You can look for them carefully on the corners of the roof moldings and so on. You can see the little barrel shaped thing here, uh, the dome shaped things on the corners. Uh, but they aren't as clear as the eighth century temple that we saw. And in comparison to this eleventh century temple, I mean, this was just incredible. Just look at the level of detail. Uh, with which every single architectural module has been executed. Look at these beautiful little dome shapes, um, these beautifully executed little layers. Um, and of course, um, sorry, I think somebody has got their mic on. Um, yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, the, again, once again, on, on the walls, these miniature temples are depicted. Um, so if you look at this diagram in the center, you can really see that uh, over the course of these 500 years that I've, I'm, I've been, I, that I want to talk about, um, temple forms and temple designs become ever more complex. And this is not something that is driven primarily by royal courts. Uh, this is a process that is driven uh, by sthapati guilds or architect guilds who are actually moving around in search of royal patronage, um, learning designs from various regions and kind of adapting those ideas and engineering uh, solutions that best fit their royal patrons. Uh, whereas in the sixth and seventh centuries, most temples are built only by kings. Uh, by the 11th century or so, you begin to see uh, uh, an increasing uh, increasing incidence of temples that are uh, constructed by vassal kings or by ministers or by generals uh, indicating that uh, the, the the upper class is becoming wealthier and wealthier and that there are more and more options for them uh, in terms of political economy to commission structures like this um, and i'm just a temple architecture nerd so i'd just like to point out how if you look at the floor plans of these temples they grow from these very simple kind of squares to basically a layered square that becomes ever more complex uh, to the point where the architects seem to decide that you know what um, let's just get rid of these layered squares entirely because it, it's just it's just too difficult to keep track of uh, and let's have a square rotated around its axis uh, giving us this beautiful kind of stellate form uh, that you see in this temple here and of course in this magnificent temple uh, from north karnataka um so so much for the chalukyas um, basically uh, the tldr of the chalukyas is they essentially uh, unleash this wave of architectural um, and artistic innovation and really emerge as the first uh, major Deccan superpower. Uh, and this is something that is kind of continued by the Rashtrakuta dynasty that succeeds them. Um, this is this is uh, an example of a Rashtrakuta temple. This is the Dashavatara cave temple, which you can see in Ellora today. Um, and I'd just like to point out a few interesting things about it. Um, look at the way that this hallway that you see on your left is designed. Um, it's, it's a cave temple, so it's actually excavated horizontally uh, into, into into a cliffside. Um, and why were the pillars spaced the, the way they were? Um, why is this sculpture situated at the end of this corridor? Um, it's because the architects very clearly wanted to play with light and space uh, to give you the sense of a kind of a rhythmic emanation where out of nothing, out of this totally plain floor and the plain roofs, all of a sudden this sculpture of extraordinary dynamism is suddenly exploding um, and of course i don't have a it's not visible in this picture but every single niche in the walls actually has a similar sculpture to this um, and you can really imagine with multiple rows of pillars um, as you're looking down and changing your the way you're looking at these pillars it's like your vision is almost being refracted through a kaleidoscope or through a jewel um, and at, at each surface is a different sculptural niche uh, depicting a different deity which, which is very very interesting to think about the, the the design sense of the person who made this in terms of a uh, sculpture itself um this uh this is this is a true masterpiece um and if you really think about how was it that this particular sculpture was designed and how was it carved um i would like you to imagine that you know both of these sculptures originally had their legs right um and both of the legs are also intertwined at the center so uh and the way they're carved is it's almost in the round they almost seem to kind of pop out of the rock so what the sculptor has done is he's given he's given you a sense of two kind of stone forms that are propelling themselves towards each other at great speed uh intertwined almost in this kind of um ruthless combat um, and the way they're depicted, just look at the, the gods uh, movement, right? Um, imagine a stone sculpture, imagine if you will, 
um, something of stone actually trying to move and contort itself into this position and the kind of energy that uh, an inanimate object could require to kind of move itself like this. Uh, the god almost seems to radiate with power. Uh, that's kind of amplified by the way his arms are all outstretched. Uh, and compare this to the very static composition that we began this presentation with of that Varaha, who is essentially just doing one thing. He's just standing and moving upwards. Whereas this god is, he's pivoting around his waist. His arms are all moving in different directions. Um, he's, his hand is grabbing this demon uh, and he's about to perhaps disembowel him uh, with a weapon that has since fallen away. Um, now, once again, just as the Varaha was probably meant to be an analogy for the Chalukya king, um, this uh, Narasimha is probably meant to be an analogy for the man who overthrew them, uh, a young man called Danti Durga of the Rashtrakuta clan. Um, and this, in that sense, is probably meant to be an analogy for the last Chalukya king. Um, and of course, this is the first Rashtrakuta king who's overthrowing him. Uh, so once again, once you like open your eyes to the art history, um, you begin to see um, that these that the people who commissioned this, I mean, really to to uh, identify yourself with the god and to have a sculpture like this commissioned, um, which which has this very unique kind of proportions, right? I mean, this god is exaggerated head, exaggerated, exaggerated hands, legs, um, this unique kind of creative style. Um, shows you that the men who were commissioning these art forms um, were not simple barbarians or simple warlords. Uh, they were men of sophistication, also men of violence. Um, so what really was the world of the Rashtrakutas like? Um, interestingly enough, we have evidence from the Arab world, uh, from Arab travelers writing in the ninth uh, century, the, the ninth and 10th centuries, uh, claiming that there are four great kings in the world. Uh, the Abbasid Caliph, of course, is first and foremost. Uh, second after him is the Emperor of China. Third after him uh, is the uh, Emperor of Rome. Uh, and fourth is the Emperor of the Deccan. Um, so the Arabs clearly recognized that the Deccan was the great superpower of the Indian subcontinent uh, and quite explicitly tell us in multiple, uh, uh, multi on multiple occasions uh, that there is no Indian king who has a greater regard for the Arabs uh, than the Vallabha uh, or the Lord of the Deccan. Um, and really just look at the scale of the trade networks we're talking about here. Uh, they're stretching all the way from Europe um, and we even have evidence of uh, interactions with, um, uh, with Sweden. Uh, through the movement of various objects, um, stretching all the way into China. Uh, and of course, most of these goods are moving over the oceans. Um, and India is at the center of the Indian Ocean. Uh, so India was really integral to this uh, emerging system of, of, of world trade uh, that we see in the ninth and 10th centuries. Um, once again, coming back to the coin that I used in the beginning of this presentation, um, as you can see, it's a gold coin. And here the Rashtrakut Emperor Govinda III uh, is depicting himself standing on a horse, uh, sorry, sitting on a horse. Um, why is this the case? Why is it that he's depicting himself in gold? Why is he using this uh, kind of pseudo Arabic script? Uh, and why the horse? Um, simply put, it's because the Rashtrakutas imported uh, horses from the Arabian Peninsula uh, to use in their in their wars and conquests uh, in the Indian subcontinent. Um, so what what Govinda is trying to do with this coin is trying to depict himself as a kind of modern and world facing monarch uh, who is globalized, who is trying to use the Arab script, and of course who is riding uh, the premier uh, object of the global arms trade at the time. Uh, namely the Arab war horse. Um, there's even more examples of like how cosmopolitan the Rashtrakutas were and what their approach uh, to global trade was. Uh, the inscription that you see on the bottom right uh, was left by an individual called uh, Madhumati, who was a son of Sahi Arahara. Um, that's a Sanskritization of uh, Muhammad ibn Shahriyar, uh, who was a Persian who had settled down uh, in Sanjan uh, here in southern Gujarat, which was one of the major ports of the Rashtrakutas. Um, and you can see that Madhumati here is claiming that I have conquered the chiefs of all the harbors. Uh, I made a grant for the repair of the Matha and for the Naivedi of the goddess Durga, uh, which again are things that we have seen in earlier slides Indian kings doing. Uh, so very clearly, just as uh, the Rashtrakutas are presenting themselves to the Arab world, you also have Arabs and Persians who are trying to present themselves in very profoundly Indian ways. Um, so this time period that I'm talking about, 1200, is also a period of cosmopolitanism. It's a period of movement uh, of people, ideas, and goods uh, between the farthest corners of the world. Um, so roughly around the late 10th century or so, uh, the Rashtrakuta dynasty was once one, w w collapsed and was replaced by a, a new dynasty calling themselves the Chalukyas of Kalyana, 
um, we have no idea whether these later Chalukyas were actually Chalukyas or just using the name uh, because it was basically good branding for them in the 11th century. Um, and what these guys do very soon after they come to power uh, is they commission poetry, um, which, uh, which will allow me to talk uh, about how literature was used as an integral aspect of royal power. Um, one of the most uh, magnificent uh, examples of a text that we have from this time uh, is the Gada Yuddham of Rana. And to me, it is very fascinating because um, it, it's basically a story of the Mahabharata, um, the story of the rivalry between Bhima and Duryodhana. Um, Duryodhana, as you know, in the Mahabharata is supposed to have uh, ordered that Draupadi, the wife of the Pandavas, be stripped in open court, uh, at which point Bhima, uh, the strongest of the Pandava brothers, uh, says that he will shatter Duryodhana, Duryodhana's thighs uh, and uh, bathe Draupadi's hair with, with uh, Duryodhana's blood. Um, so in the Gada Yudham, uh, Rana basically makes uh, Duryodhana into a fascinating kind of anti-hero in a sense. Uh, even though he dies at the ending of, of, of the story, uh, he's made into a very relatable character. Um, and it's also a book that is extremely, extremely replete with extremely violent imagery. Um, there are multiple scenes where the heroes are literally wading through fields of blood and gore, um, which are described in like with, with almost uh, in very vivid and almost a lurid detail uh, with uh, you know ghouls sucking on the bone marrow of fallen warriors and that kind of thing. Um, very interestingly, to this day, uh, the Kannada word for vulture is ranahabe, which means a battle eagle. Um, so that really gave you a sense of like how widespread uh, war was in medieval Karnataka that vultures were seen only on battlefields and that's why they were called uh, Ranahabbis, uh, battle eagles. Um, we also see uh, the, the Chalukyas of Kalyana uh, using literature to kind of rewrite royal lives uh, and write new histories for themselves. Um, just as of course our modern political leaders uh, tend to pay advertising agencies to write very favorable um, uh, depictions of, of their of their activities. Uh, similarly, the Chalukyas of the 11th century um, commission texts, uh, for example, the Vikramanka Deva Charitam written by a Kashmiri pundit called Bilhana, who actually migrated all the way from Kashmir uh, to North Karnataka. Um, and there he basically depicts his patron Vikramaditya VI uh, as being essentially another Rama. Uh, whereas in reality, Vikramaditya was a man who uh, basically drove his father to suicide uh, and um, killed his elder brother. Uh, so pretty dark, I know, but such was politics in the medieval world. Um, the verse that you see at the bottom of your screen um, is, uh, is, is describing the Chalukya king, uh, Jayasimha II. Um, and I think it brings me to another wider point, which I think is very often neglected when we talk about the early medieval period, uh, which is just how pervasive violence against women was. Uh, there's a tendency today to generally assume that um, violence against women uh, was something that was introduced uh, by quote unquote uh, invaders from Central Asia. Um, but as this should show you like quite clearly, um, Indian kings were um, no less pleasant in their attitude towards uh, women. Um, it says, uh, do not the hand devoid of wristlets, the breast devoid of necklace, the eyes deprived of coal, the ear without the earring, the waist bare of girdle, and the tender leaf-like feet wanting the ankles of the wives of his enemies bespeak the heroism, the, over, or the overpowering power, and the prosperity of the king. Uh, so very clearly, the, the virility and the martial success of the king are intertwined with his ability to enact violence against his enemies, and especially against the women of his enemies. And we'll see, of course, uh, more examples of that in the next slide. Um, roughly around the early 11th century or so, um, we of course have the child case of Kalyana, who I talked about in the last slide. Uh, but you also see the emergence of an unprecedented new South Indian superpower, uh, the Chola Empire. Uh, you can really see it dominated much of the southern portion of India uh, through much of the 11th century. Um, in the mid 11th century or so, by the mid 11th century rather, uh, you begin to see the Chalukyas and Cholas uh, getting into ever escalating violence against each other uh, because the Cholas, uh, who are based in the Kaveri River Valley, are interested in seizing another river valley for themselves, namely the Raichur Duab here in northern Karnataka. Uh, in order to do that, they must contend with the authority of the Chalukyas of Kalyana based here. Um, so in the mid 11th century, um, just to give you once again a sense of just how violent this time was, um, the Chola Emperor Raja Raja actually reaches all the way to Kalyana, his rival's capital. Uh, by this time, the, the Chalukya court has mostly fled, but uh, Raja Raja still actually burns the city to the ground and performs a ritual called the hero's uh, consecration or the Veera Abhisheka. Uh, and in order to do that, he actually takes this uh, Dwarapala or a door guardian statue from a temple in Kalyana and he forces it to be a witness 
uh, almost a stand-in for the Chalukya court as he's going through this. And the reason why we know this in such detail is because um, on the base of this pillar, uh, on the base of the statue, which incidentally is in Tanjore today, uh, which was one of the Chola capitals, uh, it says that this was the door guardian uh, brought back by a Sri um, uh, Raja de Raja Deva uh, from burning the city of Kalyanapuram. Um, so this is a time where you know kings took pride in enacting violence against their enemies. Um, there's um, a little earlier before that, before the before this particular conflict, um, we actually have another instance of Chola violence against a city. Um, this is describing the burning of Manikheta. You'll see it on the left. Uh, Manikheta was formerly the capital of the Rashtrakutas and was the first capital of the Chalukyas of Kalyana. And you can see here um, it, that the poet says, the women running through the smoke in the terraces of the bejeweled mansions looked like lightning flashing through groups of clouds. Uh, the gods abandoning their palaces set alight by the terrible fire burning from that city suddenly fled away out of fear, suspecting it to be the fire of the apocalypse. So very clearly here, the king and his poet are proud of having burned women alive um, and of having sacked and destroyed a city so comprehensively uh, that the flames leapt up almost into the skies, um, which is pretty damn horrifying to think about and really um, makes you think about the moral complexity and really how difficult life would have been uh, if you were not a royal man in these times and even if you were a royal man. Because here on the right, you see uh, another Chola king, Vira Rajendra, is uh, describing how he, after routing his enemies, uh, he halted his hot, uh, his hot impetuous elephant uh, and donned the garland of victory. And then he plucked out, there's a list of treasures which give you an interesting sense of material culture, you know, uh, the war drum, the banner, the yak tail fans, all of that. But also the first thing that he mentions among his rivals, treasures that he stole from him, uh, are his opponent's wives. Um, which is which is pretty messed up. There's no there's no two ways about it. Uh, but also there's this cute little detail that I find interesting, uh, which is that he also stole uh, his enemy's elephant, uh, whose name was Blossom, uh, which is which is weirdly cute, uh, considering the horrors that this man is describing. Uh, that he captured an elephant called Blossom and that he was so proud of it. Um, so um, just to give you a little bit of context is of course something that you will read in more detail in my book if you choose to buy it um, about the Chola kings very very often came to rather nasty deaths uh, Raja Di Raja the king who burned down Kalyana who we talked about in the last slide um, actually died on the battlefield uh, he was killed while he was on elephant back uh, he was beheaded and his head was taken back to the Charikya capital um, and he was known thereafter uh, by the Cholas as uh, Anai Meir Unjanadevar which means um, the king who died on the back of elephant so yeah, I'm probably, I sound, probably sound like a broken record at this point, but yeah, violent, violent time, violent, violent people. Um, so before I move over to questions, uh, and just to make sure that uh, I don't give you a sense of a period that is just too utterly bleak for us to relate to, um, I'd like to uh, discuss this uh, beautiful little excerpt from an, Arab, um, from an Arab merchant who was writing a letter in the 12th century. Uh, it's a letter to his wife, who has apparently written to him uh, asking him for a divorce because um, he's been away from home for many years and she's not sure when he's going to return. And he says, um, if this is your wish, I cannot blame you for the waiting has been long. Um, uh, and he, there's this whole thing about if you wish separation from me, here's this bill of divorce and you are free. Um, but if it's not your decision, not your desire, then do not, do not, don't make these years of waiting pointless. Uh, perhaps I will come home soon and perhaps the relief is at hand. Uh, and he also says, all day long, I have a lonely heart and I'm pained by your separation. And I feel that pain while writing these lines. So as monstrous as the violence, as the elite directed political violence was at this time, you also have these extraordinary glimpses of humanity, because I'm sure that all of us in various ways have felt um, the same kind of raw, scaring emotions that this Arab merchant is writing about. Um, and though it has not been captured in the kind of um, very violence focused uh, and elaborate courtly literature of India, we can imagine that all these people that I've been talking about shared the same kind of emotional worlds that you and I inhabit. Um, and to think of a world that is full of people as searingly real as us, um, who are driven by the same kind of forces of um, elite violence and of the intertwining of religion and politics, uh, as also of global trade and cosmopolitanism, the dynamics that we see so clearly in our world, um, to see how similar they are and how different also, and to think of their world as basically ours in an earlier form, um, never ceases to inspire um, awe and wonder in me. Um, so on that note, um, thank you so much for listening. Um, please check out my book if you found uh, this talk interesting, uh, and I would be delighted to take your questions.
Thank you so much, uh, uh, Anirudh. That was um, simply marvelous because, uh, you know, uh, we all read about uh, uh, kingdoms and times uh, in history books and they turn out to be so bland and uh, uh, so marking of just dates, but not really of either individual or of community, you know, sort of activity and action. So I, I guess it's books like this that will really uh, sort of bring out, uh, I don't know, the charms of history for all of us. Um, I'll read you out a couple of questions, um, you know, uh, and comments. Uh, right in the beginning, I think Varun Patak uh, commented that uh, instead of mentioning it as Indian mutiny, could you please write it as India's first war for independence? Sure. And, uh, a lot of attention to it, but okay, sure. okay. And Sahiti has uh, asked as to um, what were the predominant languages that were spoken in Dakhina in the earlier Middle Indian era, medieval India era? That's a good question. Um, so it was primarily Old Canada and um, what we would call Maharashtri Prakrit, basically the immediate predecessor to, uh, to Marathi. Um, and of okay. course, elites uh, spoke to a great extent Sanskrit. Uh, Sanskrit was the language of the cosmopolitan world. It connected them uh, to the wider world, like stretching all the way from Afghanistan into uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and you see most inscriptions at the time were usually written in Sanskrit, while a lot of literature tended to be focused in old time. Um, so I had a question. So, you know, there's obviously remarkable skills in uh, sculpturing. Uh, and what kind of tools did they use and what kind of influences? Were there uh, influences on their sculptures even at this time? from Europe and so on? Um, not Europe, definitely not Europe, but um, I would say that other parts of India were very influential in kind of shaping the Chalukya artist idiom. Um, we have a tendency, right? We think about India as just a, a single entity, whereas in reality, it's, it's actually composed of uh, many distinct geopolitical entities. Each of these entities had its own kingdom, its own kind of art style. Very often, even, even within kingdoms, you would see um, multiple different styles kind of coexisting. Um, you would see architect and sculptor guilds who are moving from one kingdom to another, one court to another, um, who are moving between Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain patrons and kind of uh, importing iconographic elements between all these three religions that we tend to think of as distinct today, but weren't necessarily that clear cut in the early medieval period. Um, and as a result of these migrations and of course of these interactions between religions and regions, um, you, you begin to see such kind of very cosmopolitan kind of influences emerging. Um, for me, at least, it is when, when you look at the art of Gandhara, for example, right, it's very clear to us that, oh, wow, you know, here's, here's Greek art used with Indian elements. So it seems very distinct to us. But to me, it is equally fascinating to see something in the Tamil country, which has like North Indian elements, because I'm like, damn, you know, these are influences that are traveling over thousands of miles to actually get here. Um, and they are no less a sign of a globalized world uh, than the art of Gandhara is. Um, in terms of tools, I mean, these are like fairly straightforward rudimentary tools. They're using um, chisels and they're just using um, their hands. They're not, they don't have any other more sophisticated tools than that. So it is really very impressive to see the sheer artistry they're able to achieve um, with those. Uh, so what kind of literature is available? You know, you uh, quoted some um, uh, sort of writings. Uh, is there intensive literature available from extensive literature available from that period, or are you basing it on uh, just stone sculptures and so on? No, no. So um, my methodology involves art history as well as literary history. So I do use uh, land grants as well as literature from the times. Um, there's an extensive bibliography uh, in my book, almost 70 pages, where I talk about this in a great deal of detail. Um, but uh, there are multiple sources that survive from the medieval deck. And you have uh, the Ashastilaka. Um, you have, uh, of course, the Vikramanka Devicharitam, the Gadha Yudham. Um, not as much as we would want. Uh, we know, we, we very clearly get the sense that hundreds, if not thousands of texts were actually composed in this time, of which only the few written by, you know, the, the 0.1%, usually the imperial and royal courts, are the ones that actually survived. Um, but there is sufficient literature to, if not um, reconstruct in excruciating detail, uh, at least to paint in vivid and broad brushstrokes. Uh, the lives of the people at the time, which is really the approach that I take in my book. I think uh, Suki's internet has stopped. I'll take the next question. Oh, sure, sure. Um, yeah, uh, just a second. 
uh, okay so there's a question what role did uh, uh, yadavas and shilharas played in the politics of medieval deccan were there any bits as consequential to the rashtrakutas and cholas yeah yeah absolutely um in fact on on multiple occasions the lords of the deccan actually go out of their way to go and attack the shilaharas uh, because the shilaharas control a very vibrant coastal polity uh, with thriving connections to the arab world uh, so it is very important to the emperors of the deccan to kind of subjugate the shilaharas and make sure that they are uh, in, working in their interests uh, making sure that they are uh, transporting forces to them making sure they pay their tribute on time and so on um and the other was also very important really the other was emerge onto the historical scene um as vassals of the chalukyas of kalyana um there's a very interesting inscription which once again kind of like highlights uh, how prevalent violence against women was uh, where they basically say that um they 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 found the goddess fortune on the battlefield uh, gave her a sound thrashing for associating with a rival king and forced her to take the place of an obedient obedient housewife uh in the court of the chalukya king um and that just tells you in two lines very clearly um how these people thought about marriage and religion uh, sorry and and um, and violence against women okay shrikant yati has asked about asked for your email id if you would like to share it at the end uh, of the yes, program yes sure, sure, sure. i'll i'll put down in the chat box yeah. and uh, maria lobo says that she's grateful for the times that we live in because um, uh, you know uh, we can of course um, know more about the past from you and thank you for making it inter- interesting okay. so nanda has asked about uh, when did jainism come in and uh, uh, you know one would think that with the emergence of the innovative peaceful uh, religion uh, that must be around the time of the chalukyas and deccan the number of wars would have reduced but uh, do we still see the bloody clashes it's actually the other way around jainism becomes more violent in the deccan because of how a uh, prevalent political violence is uh, in fact uh, south indian jainism is very unique in that sense because it kind of develops this philosophy that um, compares the jinna who conquers his senses uh, to the aristocrat who conquers his enemies um, and so you see um, many generals and kings who um who actually patronize jain temples and jain sculptures in fact uh, if you go to shravana balagola which is to this day one of the great sites of yeah. jainism in south india um the statue of gomateshwara bahubali is actually commissioned by a general uh, called chamundaraya uh, so clearly him being a general and a man of war did not get in the way of his jain right so whoever was more influential and drew the yeah so um uh are there uh, you know the inferences that you've made about the temple architecture uh, are they uh, the inferences are there any written records of that or are these the historians uh, interpretation uh, so they're mostly based on art historians interpretations and of course reading um, the sources um the literary sources alongside the art historical sources um so whereas if you were to look at the work of uh, abraham erali or nilakantha shastri the great historian of the 20th century uh the way they write about these periods is you know there'll be a racy like action packed political history sequence uh, where every king is basically the same person doing the same things you know they're born they get married they fight a battle they build a temple they die and then there's a there's a like half the book is about society in which one one page is like women and like five pages are art and it's totally disconnected from the politics of the time right but look at our own art look at the art that we produce as a society our, our art is always political um why do we assume that the art of the medieval period was in any way less political um and we we will never know exactly how these people saw that because of the lack of sources but we can certainly make some inferences from the sources that survive uh, and in the process like hopefully add a little more nuance and begin a conversation about how to really interpret these uh, as more than merely religious objects uh, sahiti asks another question you had mentioned kannada and ancient uh, and old marathi So when did Telugu and Tamil uh, languages emerge? Uh, Tamil is actually the older in terms of having a literary tradition. Uh, we know of a Tamil literary tradition from at least three hundred BC or so, um, and Telugu also coexisted. I think Telugu branches off from Kannada and Tamil uh, in the early centuries of the Common Era, um, and um, we know of Telugu literature also starting from roughly uh, the early eleventh century or so. Um, so the the thing is that. Uh, a language having a established and written literary culture is usually much later uh, from the language's actual evolution emergence as a language you know you might have 
uh, peasants and folk singers who are already using something to recognize as that language, which we would just never know because the only time it's actually been written down is in this highly Sanskritized courtly form uh, by royals many, many centuries after it's already been established. Um, so these languages certainly did coexist. And it was even, even, even the medieval period was a highly cosmopolitan, multilingual time, just like ours. And what language, uh, Samriddhi asks, what language are the original inscriptions or the excerpts in, that you read? Somewhere? Most of them are in Sanskrit, though there are a few in Old Kanda as well that I've, that I've received translations for and used in this presentation. Uh, so, uh, uh, Mita mentions that with the political messages in some of the sculptures, are these apparent to the general public or, um, you know, is it a freely understood interpretation? I think it's a rephrasing of the same uh, thing. I don't think that the general public is very well aware of this. Um, at least in my experience on social media and WhatsApp, most of what you see is, oh, this king was so devout and therefore made such and such sculpture. Uh, and there's really no discussion of the context um, and the ways to actually read it. Uh, these kinds of things are actually mostly kind of confined to scholarly literature. Uh, and actually one of the main reasons why I wrote my book was to kind of make sure that these interpretations come into the general public domain and are written in an engaging way to try and like spread them as far as possible. And I'm sure uh, we, when we read it, we will share it on social media, our understanding from what you said. Uh, Srinivas uh, mentions, uh, what were some of the most important scientific and intellectual breakthroughs in the medieval decade, philosophy, technology, etc.? Were the Deccan kingdoms at any point the most culturally and scientifically advanced kingdoms in the world? And were the Deccan kingdoms the richest kingdoms in Asia? These are, that's what, those are interesting questions, but very difficult to answer with the sources that survive. Um, what we do know for certain is that there were significant interactions between the Deccan and the wider world. Um, we know of various, um, I mean, I don't know if scientists is the right term, but we do know of scholars from the Deccan who were employed uh, in the Abbasid House of Wisdom uh, in Baghdad in the ninth century. Um, and we also have these tantalizing suggestions that Abbasid innovations, uh, including, for example, um, fountains um, and these very fine kind of automata, um, steam powered automata kind of thing, um, were actually present in medieval Deccan courts. Um, we need more archaeology really to be sure of the extent of these exchanges, but the sense that we certainly get is that these people love technology. They, would, they, they did not see themselves as technologically backward. Um, if anything, the scale of their architectural achievements shows you that they had engineering capabilities of a very, very high order. Um, in terms of what precisely they knew and what precisely they could achieve, um, these are things that we can only infer from some literature, um, but I would not necessarily think that they're any less um, sophisticated in any other part of the world. I would talk of examples of like uh, sugar refining technology, uh, incense making, uh, perfume making. These are all things that India was very well known for. Um, in terms of how wealthy it was compared to other parts of the world, we don't have tax information to reduce uh, because these kings, we don't know how they kept their records, whether they were destroyed by other invading uh, armies um, or like just were lost to the mists of time. Uh, but it's really difficult to answer the question of like whether they were the richest. They certainly were glamorous. They certainly were seen as such by the contemporaries, but we can't say for sure. So Commander Mohan Narayan would like to know if you could elaborate on the maritime trade with the Arabian Peninsula and were there any trading links with Southeast Asia as well? Yes, yes, uh, there certainly were. Um, we, we know of, um, in fact, there's, there's one very interesting example I came across in the Yashastilaka where uh, a horse from Cambodia is presented to the king. Uh, and in fact, there's a whole uh, committee of experts there who have um, given the horse a passing grade on various uh, detailed um, little factoids that they have. Uh, and a poet is standing there uh, waxing eloquent about, uh, about the wonders of horses and so on. Um, so <laughs> it's a very interesting uh, uh, kind of uh, courts to actually be in. Um, in terms of um, the, the trade of the Arab world, again, uh, I don't want to give too much away because I really hope that you will read my book, Commander. Um, but we know of like uh, thousands of Indian commodities that are known to the Arabs. Uh, we know of Indian almonds, Indian poisons, Indian weapons that are being exported to the Arab world, um, and much, much more. Uh, so a lot of people have mentioned that they're reading your book and, uh, you know, either halfway through it and so on. Srinivas Ghatis says that he's really, uh, he really likes the book and he wants to know on what topic your next book is going to be. 
um, it's going to be all medieval South India, uh, but I'm still doing my research. I'm still like talking to publishers and all that. So I'm afraid I can't give you a solid answer at this point. So uh, Sunanda, like many others, is uh, you know sort of expressing gratitude for igniting this kind of interest in the lost five centuries of the uh, Deccan, integrating stories of art, literature, and politics. Says she's going slow on the book because there's a lot of a lot to imbibe. So I guess a lot of people are looking forward to uh, completing the book, taking their own time, enjoying it. Uh, Sonal uh, would like to know how these Lords of Deccan contributed into the fort architecture of those times. That's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, we need more archaeology to be totally sure. Uh, but we do know that they did fortify things. Um, most of what they made were mud forts. On some occasions, they would actually um, make these very interesting forts of basically interlocking stone blocks, uh, where they would make a groove on one stone and a little kind of wedge on the other and kind of like lash them together perfectly without any, any cement, uh, which is exactly how they made their temples, incidentally. Uh, and they were basically applying that at a larger scale to build their own fortifications. Um, we know of great citadels. Um, I think there was a one out of Changi, which is near modern day Devanagari. area. Um, we know of um, various border, border towns, trading towns that were fortified. Um, but we need archaeology at a much, much greater scale uh, to actually come to a broader conclusion. Uh, what we do know is that Deccan certainly did have its own kind of fort building tradition, uh, even before the establishment of powers like the Bahmani Sultanate. Um, and that the Bahmani Sultanate was building on and integrating earlier Deccan traditions with their own fortifications. How oh, interesting. Uh, Mita says that you mentioned that there was a shift in who built the temples and who the temples were built for after the 8th century as more wealthy people came to power. So was there an event that occurred that promoted this um, wealth that they got? I would say it's not a single event, but rather a broader systemic change. Um, where hitherto while power was concentrated in a single kind of royal family, um, by the 8th century, these polities are becoming so widespread and so diffused uh, that these imperial centers are integrating many, many local aristocrats um, who are rising to power alongside them, who are, whose careers are integrally tied to those of the imperial court. Um, and so when they go to war, it is, it is very much uh, an activity of the entire kind of ruling elite. Uh, they are all going to battlefields together. You know, they 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 they, they their sons grow up together uh, as battle mates in a sense. Um, their wives are all in in the in in the women's quarters together, observing the politics. The men indulging in their own politics, um, and it's really so these local aristocrats who are making fortunes through wealth um, alongside the imperial court and kind of emerging as uh, and and who also want to kind of uh, present something to their own local audiences. Um, who are responsible for commissioning these temples. So it's a broader systemic change rather than a single kind of historical event. Um, I think you talked about um, um, the Lords of Tekken and Sonal wanted to know if there's any literature other than uh, you know, your book that will guide her to this. Yes, uh, read the bibliography of my book. I have dozens and dozens and dozens of sources I've, I've consulted to write it. Um, so I will not bore you with the details, but it is absolutely there. Uh, they're very scholarly. They tend to be a lot more dense and dry than Lords of the Deccan is, but um, you will thoroughly enjoy them if you have the time and the inclination. Lovely. I think we've uh, run through uh, the questions so far. Uh, a lot of thank yous and a lot of compliments for, uh, for your talk. And um, Thank you. Thank you for being here. And we all hope to read the book pretty quickly and maybe, uh, you know, ask you for what your next book is going to be in the next talk. My pleasure. Okay. My pleasure. Uh, hope you all yeah, have, a, have a great weekend. And thank you all so much for attending. Have a great weekend too, folks. And have a great weekend, folks. And thank you for being with us on this lovely Saturday evening. Thank you. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Take care.